this video will be about commons. In some ways, it is a counterpart to the video on open field systems. And like open field systems, commons are interesting because agriculture was such a major part of most people's lives until really very recently. And like open field systems, they can be found in almost any part of the British Isles, indeed across most of Europe. So what are they? Well, in short, they're pieces of land used for grazing livestock, pieces of permanent pasture. The livestock can be sheep, cows, horses, geese, goats. But instead of being part of just one farm, a common is used jointly by lots of different people. The technical term for the people who use a common is commoners. They can be large blocks of land, like this on Dartmoor, or this on Cockfield Fell in County Durham, or they can be small pieces of land, like road verges or village greens, such as these at Castle Bolton in Yorkshire, or these shown on the Ordnance Survey map of Longhorsley in Northumberland. And little commons like this, we might imagine animals being tethered, like this goat is. Commons aren't only rural. Towns often have commons as well. The town moor in Newcastle, shown here, is particularly famous. A common is used by the members of a particular community. They're not just open to anyone, and that's a common misconception. Only certain people own rights to use any particular common. Normally these rights are owned by virtue of living in a particular settlement, in a village, a town, or on a particular manor, and by owning farmland there. Sometimes rights are attached to the tenancy or ownership of particular cottages in a settlement, and these are called common right cottages. Sometimes if a village or town has grown, perhaps because it has some industry, new houses built to accommodate the incoming people do not get common rights, and the grazing rights end up being associated with particular houses only. Commons are often on land which is poor quality, at least for arable farming. They might be on wetland, like this at Long Horsley. This is the same place shown on the map. Or they might be on slopes that are too steep to plough, as are the commons in this photograph taken in Spain. But they are a valuable resource. Commoners usually defend their rights to use a common fiercely. Sometimes historical documents refer to commons as waste. So a survey of a manor might refer to a certain number of acres of waste belonging to that manor, meaning the common. But in this sense, waste is a technical term. It's not implying that the common land was valueless. So how do commons work in detail? Well, technically, in strict legal terms, the lord of the manor owns the land itself. This is said to be the right of the soil or the ownership of the soil. But the lord cannot do anything which interferes with the grazing rights of the other commoners. This was established in law by the statute of Merton in 1235. Sometimes a payment is required by the owner of the common, and this is called a geestment, when the grazing right is exercised, 
and it's particularly associated with royal forests. There were usually rules about how grazing was done. Often there were particular times of the year when the common may be used and rules about fencing between it and the arable fields. One of the most common types of rules is called stinting. This was often introduced in the medieval or the early modern period. And it was a limit on how many animals each commoner could put on the common. Each person with rights to the common owned a certain number of stints, sometimes called beast gates, each of which allowed a certain number of animals to be grazed on the common. So for instance, one stint might permit, say, one cow or four sheep or a mare and a foal. These are rights. They're not ownership of particular pieces of ground. But stints can be bought and sold, just like land can. And so some people may come to own more stints than others. They can also be sold away from the farm or cottage they were originally associated with, and they can be let. So one person might rent lots of single beast gates in order to operate on a large scale. An alternative method for controlling stocking levels on commons is called levancy and cushancy. This system relies on the fact that the number of animals a farmer may have is limited by the need to feed those animals during the winter on hay or other fodder crops grown on the lands of a lowland farm in the hill farming areas where this system is most common. This is called the in-by land. We can see this land on a map of Malastang in Cumbria. Under this system, a farmer was allowed to put as many animals onto the common in summer as could be wintered on the in by land of his or her farm. When practices like droving, in which animals were moved over long distances and grazed along the way, or the practice of buying up land stock for fattening developed, this system became less sustainable and often was replaced by stinting. At the same time, some people were beginning to set themselves up as experts on agriculture. They wrote books on it and began to apply the principles of the Enlightenment to farming. They often frowned upon unstinted pastures, and they could be influential. William Blythe, for example, was an early critic of unstinted commons in his book, The English Improver Improved, of 1652. Incidentally, whilst we're on the subject, improved agriculture is a technical term. And it refers to the sort of rational agriculture proposed by these experts, and it became an important aspect of elite culture during the 18th and 19th centuries. Some commons are used by more than one neighbouring communities. And this practice is called intercommoning. We can see an example here in County Durham, where the land shaded yellow is intercommoned by the parishes of Walsingham, Stanhope, and Tallaw. The red lines show the township boundaries, and we can see that the common itself is outside all three of the township. The yellow shows the area of the modern registered common, although it's likely that it was larger in the past. Sheathings and transhumans are other features which you will come across if you are looking at commons. In certain parts of the United Kingdom, particularly Scotland, Northern England, and the West Country, people went and lived on the commons with their animals 
during summer and return during the winter. This practice is called transhumance and the settlements in which they lived on the common are often called shielings. You often find place names, including the element shield. And often this is derived from the word shieling. Although as this can also be associated with fishing settlements, it's not certain evidence of the practice of transhumans. Sometimes sheathing settlements became permanent as arable land expanded. Some commons have trees growing on them, in which case they're called wood pastures, and they provided timber as well as grazing. It has been shown that some place names, which include the element wald, were the sites of wood pastures in the early medieval period. As farming changed during the early modern period through the 18th and 19th centuries, commons became gradually less important and many were enclosed. Again, this was partly to do with the rise of improved agriculture. Some experts might have frowned on unstinted commons, but really most would have preferred no commons at all, notably Arthur Young, who was especially influential. And this is because it's difficult to control animal breeding on commons and to make improvements by, for example, planting particular types of grass. Nonetheless, many survive. And in 1965, the Commons Registration Act was passed to formalise and record the common rights, which were often customary. Under this act, commons which were registered became the actual joint property of the commoners, and they survive in this form today. And the extent of these registered commons in England is shown on this map. The grazing is the most important use of commons, but it's certainly not the only one. They were used for lots of other different things, and many of these uses are quite important. Perhaps the most significant is gathering fuel. It might be wood from shrubs like gorse, for example, or in some places where there's peat, it might be cutting turfs. There's a technical term for the right to cut peat for fuel, which is turbury. Commons often became the sites for little bits of industry too. Quarries for building stone are very common. Sometimes there might be more sophisticated things like little coal mines or metal mines. This photograph shows the remains of an early coal mine of a type technically called a bell pit on Cockfield Fell in County Durham. Commons were also useful simply as large open spaces. They might be used for anything from military manoeuvres to executions. And they were particularly useful as places to hold fairs. Many fairs dating back to the medieval period were held on commons. Initially, of course, these were for buying and selling agricultural produce. But they always had entertainment aspects, and those which has survived to this day, is the entertainment has become the primary element. Other types of leisure were also practiced on commons. So for instance, on Fairfield Heath in Hertfordshire, there's traditional horse racing. By the 19th century and into the middle of the 20th century, commons began to be very important for shooting, for sports, for example, grouse. Indeed, they still are used very much for that today. And we can see some grouse butts here on a common in Yorkshire. To prevent the game birds being disturbed, the owner of the, th the soil, you know, the lord of the manor, that is, in most cases, began to restrict access to commons. 
whereas previously there hadn't really been very much concern about people walking across a common, even if they weren't commoners. At the same time, of course, the industrial towns were growing, and workers from them wanted to be able to have access to open countryside to escape the town for exercise and for leisure on their day off on Sunday. And this led to conflict and ultimately to things like the mass trespasses of the 1930s in the Peak District and elsewhere. Common land, of course, remains important today as a leisure space. Indeed, most of the places where people hike in the lakes of the Peak District or in the Scottish Highlands, for instance, are common land. So what might we learn about commons by studying them? One important question is how rights were exercised in a particular place and the form they took and how they were managed. Because these were based on custom and usage, they can vary greatly between different settlements and there are regional patterns as well. We might just as much be interested in the origins of different types of rights. Transhumance is a particularly interesting phenomenon. We might be interested in how it originated in particular places how it changed through time, why certain shielding sites became permanent when others did not, and perhaps most interesting of all is who was involved and how this affected the community. Typically, transhumance is practiced by a certain section of the community, say young men or women, and that has particular social implications. The records of whatever body administered a particular common would be the main source for any study. This might be a manor court, might be a town corporation. There are other types of meeting as well, but these are less likely to have left records. Place names often refer to commons and the practices associated with them. And so these might offer a clue too, as might the archeology span of shielding sites or other structures like shepherd's huts, folds, boundary markers, and markers on tracks. If a common has been enclosed, the records of his enclosure are often a good starting point too, but don't usually give a full picture. 